Your immune system should protect you from disease, but occasionally it does not do this. One condition you can have that's a disorder of the immune system is hypersensitivity. This is an immune response against a foreign antigen. The response is either exaggerated or it's inappropriate. There are four types of hypersensitivity. Type 1 or immediate hypersensitivity, type 2 or cytotoxic hypersensitivity, type 3 or immune complex mediated hypersensitivity, and type 4, delayed or cell mediated hypersensitivity. Type 1 or immediate hypersensitivity is usually localized. These are what we think of as allergies. Occasionally it becomes systemic and this is anaphylaxis. Type 1 hypersensitivity results from the release of inflammatory molecules, particularly histamine. This release of histamine happens immediately after exposure to the antigen. Because these are typically allergies, we call these antigens allergens. The first time an individual is exposed to something that's going to be an allergen, they are sensitized to it. This means that they form IgE-type antibodies. The constant region of the IgE antibody will attach to mast cells, basophils, and eosinophils. The next time you're exposed, we get an antigen-antibody complex. This causes histamine to be released from the mast cells. We get the localized inflammation because of the histamine release, but we also get eosinophilia. Eosinophilia is an increase in eosinophils. Eosinophils, remember, contain antihistamine, so the body will actually try to launch a counterattack to the allergy. In a type 1 hypersensitivity, something that really is not a threat to us is taken in by an antigen-presenting cell, and we develop B cells that produce IgE antibodies. These code up mast cells, basophils, and eosinophils. This first exposure does not result in any kind of response to the allergen. But the next time we see the allergen, the allergen will bind to these antibodies. These antigen antibody complexes will cause release of histamine from the mast cells. That will give us the localized inflammation. Eosinophils will also be activated, so we'll get some antihistamine release as well. Localized allergic reactions are usually mild, and they occur only at the site that was the portal of entry for the allergen. A wide variety of substances can act as allergens. Most of them are quite common. Dust, pollen, fungal spores like aspergillus. Some people are allergic to latex or wool or nuts like peanuts. Whenever the allergen enters the body, the mast cells degranulate at the site of contact, and you get that localized inflammation, redness, swelling, and heat. Systemic reactions are what we call acute or anaphylactic reactions. Here the mast cells rapidly degranulate and histamine enters the bloodstream. The bronchial smooth muscle is very sensitive to histamine and will rapidly swell. This blocks the airway and the individual can suffocate if they are not treated immediately. The first treatment is simply to try to avoid the allergen. This will prevent the symptoms from developing. If symptoms develop, antihistamines can be used. Now, while histamine is the major mediator of inflammation, other chemical mediators are also involved. So antihistamine will take care of the majority of the symptoms, but will not relieve all of the symptoms. Asthmatics really can't take antihistamines. Glucocorticoids are a little better choice for them. And of course, someone in anaphylactic shock needs an immediate treatment with epinephrine. In type 2 or cytotoxic hypersensitivities, cells are destroyed by an immune response. This is the basis for many of our autoimmune diseases. The classic cytotoxic hypersensitivity is the transfusion reaction. This occurs if donor blood contains antigens and recipient blood has antibodies to those antigens. There are at least 99 known red blood cell antigens. While ABO incompatibilities are the most common cause of transfusion reactions, there are a number of other transfusion reactions that can occur. The recipient antibodies will coat the donor's red blood cells. This will stimulate phagocytosis, agglutination, but probably the most important thing that it stimulates is complement fixation. You'll remember that the end product of complement fixation was cell lysis, so the red blood cells will lyse, something we call hemolysis. The treatment is to stop the transfusion. So here we see a case of an ABO incompatibility. 
This is an A person. They have A antigens on their red blood cells, so they're going to naturally have antibody B circulating in their blood. If they're given B blood cells, those that have B antigens on their surface, the B antibody will react with the B antigens on the red blood cells of the donor. This gives you your antigen antibody complex, complement is fixed, and the cells are destroyed. Another kind of type 2 hypersensitivity is hemolytic disease of the newborn, or HDN. This involves the RH antigen. For this to happen, you have to have an RH negative mother who gives birth to an RH positive fetus. If at the time of birth there is some exchange of blood between the mother and the fetus, then the mother can become sensitized. Mom does not have any RH antibodies unless she is exposed to RH positive blood. If she is, she makes IgG type antibodies to RH. IgG is a small enough antibody that it can cross the placenta. So during the next pregnancy, this IgG will cross the placenta. And if the next fetus is also RH positive, then these antibodies will coat the blood cells of the fetus, will activate complement, and will have hemolysis of those blood cells. The treatment for this is to block the production of the antibody in the mother using a substance called Rogam. Any RH negative mother is usually given Rogam just in case the fetus is RH positive. So here we see an RH negative mom and she is giving birth to an RH positive fetus. At the time of delivery there's a little exchange between the mother and the baby and mom produces RH antibody. In the second pregnancy, the RH antibodies can cross to the second baby. If the second baby is RH positive, those antibodies will bind to the baby's blood, causing destruction of the baby's blood. Drug-induced cytotoxic reactions can also occur. Drugs are typically too small to be antigenic, but they can bind to cells. A common cell they bind to is platelets. Once you have this drug platelet complex, it's large enough to be antigenic. Antibodies form and will bind to the coated platelets. Complement is activated by this immune complex and the platelets lice. This is going to take the number of platelets down to a dangerously low number and you get something called cytotoxic thrombocytopenic purpurea. The low platelet count inhibits blood clotting and purpura or purple hemorrhages under the skin may be seen. This kind of drug-induced cytotoxic reaction can also happen to white blood cells where you get agranulocytosis and to red blood cells where you get hemolytic anemia. The treatment is to stop taking the drug and in severe cases the patient may undergo plasmapheresis. In this treatment the patient has their blood removed, their cells washed, and they get somebody else's plasma back so that the antibodies in their plasma is removed. It's a very long process, it takes several treatments, but it's usually successful. Here you see platelets being coated with a drug, making an antigen. We make antibodies to this antigen. When the antibodies react, we fix complement, and that lyses the cell. This is what destroys the platelet numbers. This could be a white blood cell or a red blood cell just as easily. Type 3 hypersensitivities are also known as immune complex mediated hypersensitivities. Here antigens bind to antibodies producing immune complexes. Immune complexes can stimulate several processes including complement fixation and phagocytosis and other of the nonspecific defenses. Normally immune complexes are removed from the bloodstream via phagocytosis. In type 3 hypersensitivity, the immune complexes are not removed fast enough. They continue to circulate in the blood and they can become trapped in organs, joints, or tissues. Because immune complexes can trigger degranulation of mast cells, we may get localized inflammation, or the inflammation may affect a number of systems simultaneously. We treat this condition with steroids. So here we see an antigen and an antibody circulating in the bloodstream. We get the immune complexes. Phagocytes typically take them out, but if there are too many of them, or the phagocytes can't move fast enough, these antigen antibody complexes will start to accumulate on tissues. These immune complexes activate complement. Complement will call other phagocytic cells to the area. 
these cells will release immune chemicals to start inflammation, as well as try to attack and remove these immune complexes. As a result, there's a significant amount of tissue damage and we get increasing amounts of inflammation. In other words, these cells just continue to release inflammatory chemicals. Phagocytes come and eat the destroyed tissue, but they release more inflammatory chemicals, so we just keep the inflammation going. Some examples of type 3 hypersensitivity include something called pneumonitis. In pneumonitis, someone is sensitized to mold or dust or fungal spores, something that they inhale. As they inhale this material, they develop antibodies, and these antibodies coat up the lung tissue. So when they inhale the material repeatedly, these immune complexes form on the lung tissue, and we have that chronic inflammation that does damage. Things like farmer's lung, pigeon breeder's lung, mushroom grower's lung, and librarian's lung are all types of pneumonitis. In farmer's lung, they become sensitized to the mold that grows in hay. In pigeon breeder's lung, they become sensitized to dust and material in pigeon feces. Mushroom grower's lung to the mold spores that are found in mushrooms. And librarian's lung is from inhaling dust in old books. Glomerulonephritis is another type of type 3 hypersensitivity. Here, those immune complexes circulating in the bloodstream become deposited on the walls of the glomeruli. This damages the glomerulus, so we have an inflammatory process that starts in the glomerulus. This localized reaction further blocks filtration and the kidneys may shut down. Now this can be a temporary kind of situation where once we clear the antigen antibody complexes, the kidney heals, or it may be permanent, leading to renal failure and death. Another example of type 3 hypersensitivity is rheumatoid arthritis. In this situation, B cells secrete IgM, and this IgM binds to IgG that's circulating in the body. This antibody-antibody complex is deposited in joints. It activates complement and mast cells. This results in inflammation that causes the joint tissue to swell and thicken and causes severe pain. Because we now have a chronic inflammation, an inflammation that doesn't go away, we continue to eat away at the tissue so the tissue erodes. We replace the tissue with scar tissue and bone spurs so the joint deforms. We don't know the trigger for this. There may be a genetic predisposition. The treatment for rheumatoid arthritis is anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen and immunosuppressive drugs. A fourth example of type 3 hypersensitivity is systemic lupus erythematosus, or SLE. This can affect multiple organs. In this situation, antibodies are made to a number of self-antigens that are found in normal organs and tissues. They develop autoantibodies, antibodies to self, especially to DNA. DNA may be released from dead cells so that the antibodies can bind to this free DNA. These immune complexes can be deposited in the glomeruli, so you have glomerulonephritis. These immune complexes may deposit in joints, giving you arthritis. Other autoantibodies can cause hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, or may attack the heart muscle. The trigger is unknown. Some drugs seem to be associated with the development of SLE, but there may be many causes. The treatment is immunosuppressive drugs and glucocorticoids. Type 4 hypersensitivity is also known as delayed or cell-mediated hypersensitivity. This is the only hypersensitivity that does not involve antibodies. This is an interaction between the antigen, the antigen-presenting cell, and the T cells. It takes 12 to 24 hours for the reaction to develop. This delay reflects the time it takes for macrophages and T cells to migrate to the area. Examples of type 4 hypersensitivity include contact dermatitis, the tuberculin response, and a special type of type 4 hypersensitivity is graft rejection. As an example of contact dermatitis, we will use the response to poison ivy. Urushiol is the oil that comes from the poison ivy plant. This particular chemical is not large enough to be antigenic, but it can bind to skin proteins. Then it's seen as an antigen, and the T cells respond to this. 
Other substances beside urushiol can bind to skin proteins and cause contact dermatitis. Some people develop contact dermatitis to various soaps, for example. The tuberculin reaction occurs in people that have been exposed to TB or are vaccinated. In either case, these people have antibodies. When they're injected with tuberculin, they get a localized response. Tuberculin used to be killed tuberculosis organisms, but now they use PPD, purified protein derivative, only the protein portions to stimulate the response. The localized response takes about 72 hours to develop. Once you have a positive skin test, subsequent reactions may be more dramatic. As you develop memory cells, the response will be quicker and more vigorous. Graft rejection is a very special case of a type 4 reaction. There are four types of grafts you can get. An autograft is when you donate tissue to yourself, like for a skin graft. An isograft occurs if you have a genetically identical individual, like a genetic twin. Allografts are when you get grafts from the same species. This is commonly what's done with kidney transplants, liver transplants, heart and lung transplants. And xenografts are when you get the living tissue from a different species. This may sound a little science fiction, but we've been using pig heart valves for many years. When we're doing an allograft, we have to very carefully match those major histocompatibility complex proteins. We need them to match as closely as possible. Rejection occurs when the host T cells destroy the transplanted tissue. This, of course, defeats the purpose of the transplant. There is another kind of rejection. This is called graft versus host disease, and it occurs primarily in bone marrow transplants. If someone is getting a bone marrow transplant, they have their immune system completely destroyed, so they have no immune system. Then when they get the bone marrow, the bone marrow starts to develop new immune cells. Well, if these new immune cells decide that the host is now the problem, it will actually attack host cells and kill the host. There's no real treatment for this. It's typically fatal. The treatment for graft rejection includes using immunosuppressive drugs, and there are several different approaches to suppressing the immune system. One is to use glucocorticoids, or corticosteroids as they're sometimes known. These suppress the immune response in general, and this can be used for all type 4 kinds of reactions. Methylprednisolone suppresses the response of T cells to the antigen. However, this is pretty specific for T cells. It's not very effective on any kind of B cell response. Cytotoxic drugs kill actively dividing cells. This will go for any cell that is experiencing rapid growth, so this can be kind of hard on the body in general. Cyclophosphamide blocks mitosis. Azathioprine and others act as base analogs, so they interfere with DNA synthesis. Another approach is to prevent the production of the cytokines that are involved in activating T cells. This is how cyclosporine works. Because this pretty much targets the activity of the T cells, this is less toxic to other cells. And probably the newest approach is lymphocyte depleting therapies. Here they give an anti-lymphocyte globulin, an antibody to lymphocytes. A side effect of this treatment is a complete suppression of the immune system. In autoimmunity, the body attacks normal self antigens. Now this is more common in elderly and in females. There are several hypotheses for why the body develops autoimmunity. One is that estrogen stimulates the destruction of tissues by cytotoxic T's. This helps explain why women are more prone to these diseases. A second is that during pregnancy, maternal cells will pass to the fetus and colonize the fetus. This happens more often in daughters than in sons. This will trigger autoimmunity later in the life of the daughter, so that this sets the daughter up for autoimmunity. A third hypothesis is the fetal cells cross to the mother and they stimulate autoimmunity in the mother. Some may be caused by environmental factors. We have found a number of viral diseases that seem to be closely associated with the development of an autoimmune disease. Genetic factors may play a role. We know that certain major histocompatibility complex genes are common in people who have autoimmune diseases. 
Another theory is that T cells may encounter self antigens that were hidden at the time of T cell education, that some sort of injury then exposes this. For example, sperm in the male really don't start developing until puberty. At that time, the immune system is mature. Sperm never get in the bloodstream, so the immune system would never see them. However, if there is some sort of injury to the testicle and sperm enter the bloodstream, this could trigger an immune response to these proteins because the immune system would not have seen them. They would not recognize them as self. Molecular mimicry is another theory. It's believed that some organisms, some bacteria or some viruses may enter the body the body makes some sort of immune response to them. We don't really get sick with them because they're not very virulent. But as a result of these antibodies, we have antibodies that are very similar to self antigens and that these now attack self antigens. And finally, there may be a failure of the normal control mechanisms. Those regulatory T cells are part of what turns off the immune response. If they quit working, then we don't have an off switch for our immune system. This may explain why we see autoimmunity more in elderly people. Hemolytic anemia is one type of autoimmune disease. Antibodies are produced to antigens on red blood cells. As these antibodies coat the red blood cells, then we have complement fixed and this causes the lysis of the red blood cell. Type 1 diabetes mellitus has a link to a viral disease. Individuals who have type 1 frequently have a history of having had a viral disease a few months before. Here the antibodies produced go after the pancreatic beta cells. These are the cells that produce insulin, so these individuals lose the cells that allow them to produce insulin. Graves' disease also has a viral and a genetic link. Here, the antibody does not destroy cells, but rather acts like thyroid stimulating hormone. So when the antibody attaches to the cells of the thyroid gland, the thyroid gland is stimulated to grow, so we get goiter, and to secrete thyroxin, so we have hyperthyroidism, weight loss and anxiety and all of the things that go with that. Treatment for this is usually to remove the thyroid gland. Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease of the nervous system. Again, there is a bacterial or viral link that has been found in some cases. The antibodies produced destroy the myelin sheath. As a result, nerve impulses slow and over the course of time, muscle atrophies so that these people become unable to move. And rheumatoid arthritis, we've already discussed as a type 3 hypersensitivity. It's still an autoimmune disease because we don't know what triggers the production of that IgM antibody or the IgG antibody that's involved in causing rheumatoid arthritis. Immunodeficiency diseases occur when the immune system is unable to mount an effective response to some sort of invader. Primary immunodeficiency diseases are detected near birth. They develop in infants and young children. Here there is a genetic or a developmental defect in the immune system. Acquired or secondary immunodeficiency diseases develop later in life. They're the direct consequence of some recognized cause, malnutrition, severe stress, or infectious disease. The primary immunodeficiency diseases include things like chronic granulomatous disease, this is a genetic disease. Individuals with this particular disease have phagocytes that while they can ingest microorganisms, they can't destroy them. In severe combined immunodeficiency disease, or SCID, another genetic disease, these individuals don't make active T cells or B cells. These people have to live in a sterile environment because they essentially have no immune system. DeGeorge syndrome is also genetic. These individuals fail to make T cells. This has been fairly successfully treated by injecting thymic stem cells. And Bruton type A gamma globulinemia is also genetic, seen much more commonly in boys than girls. This is a B cell deficiency. These individuals can't make immunoglobulins. The acquired immunodeficiency diseases can result from a number of causes. The immune system, especially the T cells, deteriorate with age. Older individuals are immunocompromised by age. They have a higher incidence of opportunistic infections and cancer. 
Severe stress causes the secretion of corticosteroids. Corticosteroids are used to suppress the immune system. If you're making them yourself, you're still suppressing your immune system. And then we have acquired immunodeficiency syndrome or AIDS. AIDS is a syndrome. That means it's a complex of signs, symptoms, and diseases. The individual has to have an infection with HIV. They need to have a T4 cell count of less than 200 per microliter, and they show infections with a variety of opportunistic or rare pathogens, things like cytomegalovirus, herpes, or shingles in relatively young people, pneumonias from pneumocystis or reactivated tuberculosis, histoplasmosis or coccidiomycosis, which are fungal diseases of the lung, chronic diarrhea from cryptosporidium, thrush, and oral hairy leukoplakia, where the taste buds actually grow this black hairy stuff. It's not really damaging, but it looks very strange. Kaposi's sarcoma, a very rare cancer that's seen pretty exclusively in individuals with AIDS. Toxoplasmosis, meningitis with the yeast cryptococcus. These are all very common organisms, but most people do not show any illness from them because the normal immune system fights them off. The human immunodeficiency virus is the causative agent. This is an envelope virus. It has positive sense single-stranded RNA. It is a retrovirus because it contains an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. HIV-1 is more prevalent in the United States and Europe, and HIV-2 is more prevalent in West Africa. HIV-2 has about 50% of the RNA sequencing of HIV-1, but it reproduces more slowly, so the disease progresses more slowly. HIV-1, because it's here in the United States and it's in Europe, has been studied much more extensively. HIV is very similar to SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus. It appears that this virus jumped species about 1930 in Africa. By jumping species, it went from monkeys to humans. We're not sure how, but somehow the virus started infecting humans. In this country, we've detected antibodies in human blood from as early as 1959. However, the first cases were not reported until 1981. HIV has a very narrow host range. It only likes helper T cells, things in the macrophage family, monocytes, macrophages, microglia in the central nervous system. It will attack smooth muscle cells and dendritic cells. Also, it only infects humans. The replication of HIV starts with its entry. It is an envelope virus, so it's taken in by a form of endocytosis. Because it contains the enzyme reverse transcriptase, the first thing that happens is its RNA is transcribed to DNA. The DNA then moves to the nucleus where it incorporates on the nuclear DNA. This means that the virus shows latency. An enzyme in HIV called integrase is responsible for the DNA entering the host cell DNA. The infected cell will then transcribe those integrated HIV genes to make single-stranded RNA and several viral polypeptides. This virus makes long polypeptide chains. Multiple proteins are on these chains. The genomic RNA, that single-stranded RNA, a little bit of transfer RNA, and all of the viral polypeptides for one virus will bud from the infected cell. This is an immature virion. It's not infective. The actual maturation process occurs after the material has budded from the host cell. Protease, another one of the viral enzymes, will cleave those large polypeptides into the various enzymes, reverse transcriptase, integrase, and protease, and also make all of the various capsomere pieces. At this point, final maturation occurs, and now the virion is infective. So we have it coming in by endocytosis, uncoding. We use the reverse transcriptase to make DNA which migrates and inserts on the host cell as a result of integrase. Then these genes are replicated. We make the messenger RNA so that we make these long polypeptide chains. Notice we don't really put the virus together here. We get the genomic RNA. All of this 
kind of random pieces are what bud from the cell and then the assembly and maturation occurs as a result of protease taking care of cleaving all the proteins to get the exact capsid particles and the individual enzymes that we need to package with this virus. AIDS was first identified in young male homosexuals in the United States in the early 1980s. It's now worldwide. It's a pandemic. 34 million people are infected with HIV. About 7,000 new infections occur each day, with 150 of those cases being in the United States. About one-third of the infected population have AIDS. All body secretions contain HIV. Sufficient concentrations of the virus are found only in blood, semen, vaginal secretions, and breast milk. Infected blood has 1,000 to 100,000 virions per milliliter. Infected semen has 10 to 50 virions per milliliter. Everything else contains less than that and so is much less infective. The infected fluid must be injected into the body or encounter a tear or lesion in the skin or mucous membrane. Since the virus is only 90 nanometers in size, it doesn't take a very big opening for this virus to get in. We also have to get a sufficient number of the virus at one time. Now what the infective dose is for AIDS is not yet known and it probably varies with each strain of HIV. Transmission is primarily through sexual contact. There have been rare instances of transmission through blood transfusions, organ transplants, tattooing, or accidental needle sticks. Only about 1% of the population who has had an accidental needle stick has become HIV positive. Mothers may transmit HIV across the placenta and in breast milk. About one-third of the babies born to HIV-positive mothers are themselves HIV-positive. The diagnosis is usually seeing weight loss, the reduced T4 cell population, and the typical opportunistic infections in someone who is HIV-positive. Because the virus becomes latent, we have to detect HIV antibodies. There are very few circulating virions. There is a small population called long-term non-progressors. They've had HIV for decades, but they've never developed AIDS. They don't know if they got a particularly weakened strain of HIV or if they have unusually strong immune systems. The treatment is the antiretroviral therapy, or ART. This is a cocktail of three to four antiviral drugs. They will contain nucleotide analogs, integrase inhibitors, protease inhibitors, attachment inhibitors, and reverse transcriptase inhibitors. That is, we will try to mess up the production of RNA or DNA. We'll try to keep it from integrating on the host DNA. We'll try to keep it from making mature virus particles. We'll try to keep it from attaching to the host cells. Or we will try to prevent it from making DNA from the RNA. This treatment is very expensive and has to be on a very strict schedule. If it says you're supposed to take this drug every three hours, it is every three hours. Also, some of them have to be taken on an empty stomach, some have to be taken on a full stomach, so you have to balance when you eat in and amongst all of this. They're working on a vaccine, but it's very difficult to come up with one. The virus has a very high mutation rate, making it sort of a moving target in terms of coming up with a vaccine. And then there's the whole ethical issue about who do we test the vaccine on and then expose to HIV to see if the vaccine works. The best prevention is avoidance. Safe sex, not sharing needles, things like that. There is now pre-exposure prophylaxis. Tenofovir taken daily can actually protect against getting HIV. 